I call this hearing to order. Today, the committee will continue its review of SBA programs in implementing the Women's Procurement Program. This initiative was created in part because of the government's inability to meet the 5% contracting goal for women-owned small businesses. Even though this goal was set in 1994, federal agencies have yet to achieve it. Seven years, yes, seven years have passed since the Women's Procurement Program was enacted. And now, after all this time, the SBA publishes a rule that is so poorly constructed and so ill-conceived that it is insulting to the tens of thousands of women business owners that have been waiting for action. This makes it apparent that the administration is not serious about carrying out the law, and I don't believe it ever will be. In creating the program, Congress objectives were clear, to increase participation by women-owned firms in the federal marketplace. The very design of the legislation was meant to reverse, at a systemic level, the lack of women business involvement in federal contracting. But the SBA's proposed rule is just too narrow and burdensome to achieve this intent. It is evident that few, if any, women-owned businesses will benefit from the new regulation. As a result of the more than 10 million women-owned businesses in this country, only 1,247 businesses will qualify. Women entrepreneurs in industries like construction and manufacturing that are omitted are left scratching their heads. Can this be real? SBA has chosen one of the most restrictive methodologies to determine which industries will qualify for the program. Out of the 28 approaches identified by RAND, the agency chose a method that designates less than 3% of industry as underrepresented by women businesses. In doing so, it is using a dollar amount of contracts method for determining underrepresentation, which is inconsistent with the program's intent. The initiative was designed to be used as a contracting tool to reverse the underusage of women firms in the federal marketplace, not as a way to solely advance large dollar awards. A better measure will be the number of contracts method, which would find 77.1% of industries as underrepresented, or a mix of both the number and dollar approaches. The SBA is also requiring that federal agencies make a determination of discrimination before any contract can be awarded under the program. This step creates another massive roadblock in the long series of obstructions to the program's implementation. The manner in which this finding is required is vague and could add layers of unnecessary bureaucracy to the program's administration. Perhaps most problematic, the proposed rule appears to exceed what is constitutionally required. As a gender-based program, intermediate scrutiny is called for. But instead, it appears that administration stealthily applying a restricted strict scrutiny standard. They can call it what they want, but the reality is that this is a standard that has no place in this role. The truth is that the SBA's proposal does not embody the program that Congress envisioned. If this rule becomes final, the administration will be successful in blocking by regulation the program's implementation. As a result, women businesses will be one step farther from gaining access to the federal marketplace. Instead, the SBA should scrap this rule and go back to the drawing board to provide a, wi a wider path for the inclusion of women. Women-owned firms are one of the fastest growing segments of our economy. They employ nearly 13 million people and their annual payroll is almost $175 billion. These firms are driving future growth and job creation in our communities. It is long past the time that they are given greater access to the federal government 
as a customer. And with that, I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Shabbat, for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, to the committee uh, this morning, today, uh, the committee is again examining the implementation of the Women's Procurement Program by the Small Business Administration. This hearing continues the efforts of this committee to understand the issues and difficulties associated with the regulatory establishment of a program enacted by Congress back in 2000. Without prejudging the ultimate outcome of the SBA's effort, I remain concerned that the will of Congress remains unfulfilled after more than seven years, and more than two years after a federal district court ordered the implementation of the program. Federal agencies are required to ensure that small businesses receive a fair proportion of contracts uh, for <coughs> goods and services purchased by the federal government. Recognizing the growing importance of women-owned small businesses to the growth of the economy and the longstanding perceptions that women-owned small businesses were at a disadvantage in obtaining federal government contracts, Congress enacted bipartisan legislation authorizing the SBA to create a women's procurement program. Slightly more than seven years after enactment, the SBA finally issued a proposed rule to commence the process for implementation. I, like many members of this committee and many members of Congress, am somewhat dismayed at the length of time it took to begin the process of implementing the will of Congress. Administrator Preston's efforts to manage the implementation process should be commended, even if there is disagreement about the results. The notice of proposed rulemaking identifies certain industries in which women-owned small businesses are underrepresented in federal government contracting. However, I'm troubled by the fact that the notice does not provide the public with sufficient information on the type of probative evidence that would convince the agency to expand the scope of the industries initially covered by the rules. The crucial part of the program is the identification of industries in which women-owned businesses are underrepresented in the federal procurement. In the notice, the SBA proposes to calculate underrepresentation every five years, but fails to specify how it will make that calculation. Without that information, the potentially affected public has no way of accurately informing the SBA whether the proposal is adequate. In conclusion, the administrator has taken an important first step to see that the program is implemented. On the other hand, the deficiencies in the notice raise real concerns about the adequacy of the notice and comment procedures mandated by the Administrative Procedure Act. Uh, I'd urge the SBA to provide additional supplemental information to enable the public to respond to the notice in an intelligent manner. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Shabit. And now I welcome our first uh, panel. Uh, the Honorable Stephen Preston. Mr. Preston is the Administrator of the United States Small Business Administration. He has served in, the, in this capacity since July of 2006 and has testified several times before our committee. Uh, Mr. Preston, you're, you're most uh, welcome. All right. Thank you. Um, is this on? Can you hear me? Great. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. Uh, the proposed rule that will implement the Women-Owned Small Business Federal Contracting Procedures has been published in the Federal Register and is currently in the 60-day comment period. SBA has been and remains committed to implementing the statutorily authorized set-aside for the program while at the same time meeting the specific directives provided in the legislation. Based on a nonpartisan non guidance provided by the National Academy of Science, or NAS, RAND conducted a statistical review to determine underrepresentation for women-owned small businesses in federal contracting. The NAS recommended considering a variety of data sources and a variety of methodologies in order to gain a broad perspective. They did, however, emphasize the greater weight to be given to results based on contracting dollars. In addition, NAS emphasized the importance of considering more detailed industry information represented by four-digit North American Industry Classification System, which is what we would call NAICS codes. And then they highlighted the need to demonstrate that businesses in the review were ready, willing, and able to perform in federal contracting. To determine underrepresentation and substantial underrepresentation, RAND identified 28 possible approaches and considered data in the co Central Contracting Register, uh, the Federal Procurement Data System, the Survey of, of Business Owners, which is a, a broad industry-wide survey. And relying on the guidance from NAS and the results of parts in the data, RAND then zeroed in on those methods that accurately measured underrepresentation and substantial underrepresentation. 
After careful analysis of the remaining approaches and in keeping with the direction of the NAS and RAND, SBA adopted the approach that best captured the most appropriate measures. First, based on the NAS con comments and the need to align with federal policy, we used measures which considered contracting dollars going to businesses rather than the numbers of contracts. The very goal of the statute was intended to support 5 percent federal contracting dollars going to women-owned small businesses. Getting revenue from contracts is what creates value for small businesses, not numbers of contracts. And the entire appropriations, budgeting, contracting, and accounting process in the federal government is based on dollars. Second, based on NAS comments and the need to tailor the rule to address the need, we used the more detailed classifications in the four-digit NAICS codes. The proposed rule will assist certain women-owned small businesses in pursuing contracting opportunities with the federal government by providing procedures for certifying as an, el as an eligible women-owned small business, protesting eligibility determinations and awards, and providing a roadmap for agencies to make the determination that women-owned small business underrepresentations related to gender discrimination. In addition, the rule sets forth when contract officers can restrict competition to women-owned small businesses. SBA's goal is not only to develop regulations implementing those procedures, but to help women-owned businesses so they can compete both in the private marketplace and for federal contracts. I and my team were surprised at the results of the study. We learned that those women-owned small businesses registered in the CCR generally receive a higher percentage of their revenues from federal contracting dollars than other businesses, and that the data only showed underrepresentation in four categories. According to the study, once women-owned businesses register to do business with the federal government, they appear to be doing well as a percentage of their total revenues, compared with other firms in their same industries. The study indicates that the real issue is increasing the number of women-owned businesses who compete for federal contracts. In fiscal year 2007, we, SBA began an initiative to more effectively assist small businesses interested in doing business with the federal government. We've aligned our field staff, we've provided additional training so they're better, better equip, equipped excuse me, to advise, train, counsel small businesses so they're prepared to do marketing necessary to find procurement opportunities. As part of this initiative, PCRs will have a greater role in ensuring that federal agencies reach their small business procurement goals, which will increase procurement opportunities for small business. SBA has made great progress. In 2006, contracting dollars going to women-owned small businesses reached a record level, $11.6 billion. And in 2006, we experienced the largest growth in a single year since that goal was established in 1994, $1.5 billion. The amount of contracting dollars going to women-owned small business is more than two and a half times the level it was in 2000, growing at almost 17 percent per annum. In addition, subcontracting dollars have increased to over $10 billion, representing 6 percent. SBA is taking a forward-looking approach. First, our programs are tasked with growing the universe of women-owned businesses and encouraging businesses to register with the CCR, making those businesses eligible to contract with the federal government. Second, the role of SBA is to help those businesses become ready, willing, and able to undertake and build a successful track record working with the federal government. <coughs> we provided our entire field organization with a full week of training to make them more effective in outreach and training. We've rolled out new technologies to help other agencies easily identify women-owned businesses that meet their specific contracting needs. We've established outreach goals for every single district office in the country within the SBA, and we're holding federal agencies accountable for their performance through the scorecard process. We have a number of exciting initiatives planned for 2008. Uh, some highlights, SBA intends to participate in almost 600 procurement-related events which have some component of women-owned uh, small businesses uh, uh, focused on. Uh, additional training and matchmaking, we're rolling out online courses on procurement, we're realigning our field staff to focus on these opportunities. We think these initiatives will help women-owned small businesses to achieve the congressionally established goals. We must remember, I think, that there is no one single approach that will expand the participation of women-owned small businesses in federal government, rather a combination of initiatives that take into account that the individual needs of businesses uh, is the best approach to provide opportunities for women-owned small businesses to do business with the federal government. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you, Administrator Preston. And now I welcome Ms. Elizabeth Popes. Uh, Ms. Popes serves in the Department of Justice Office of Legal Counsel. She is the Deputy Assistant Attorney General and serves as counsel to the Assistant Attorney General. Welcome. You'll have five minutes uh, to make your presentation. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, uh, Ranking Member Shabbat, and members of the committee for 
allowing me to appear here today to discuss the Justice Department's legal views on the federal government's efforts to improve contracting opportunities for women. The Justice Department's view of all gender-based programs rests on a simple premise. These programs, no matter how strong their policy justification, must comply with the Constitution. To do so, these programs must be able to withstand scrutiny under the equal protection component of the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment. The type of programs addressed in the SBA's proposed rule clearly trigger this equal protection scrutiny because the programs would require federal agencies to grant contracts to some businesses and deny contracts to others on the basis of gender. The practical problem the government faces in administering these programs is determining what exactly this equal protection scrutiny means for the programs. The precise level of equal protection scrutiny that applies to a preference program depends on the type of preference at issue. Preferences such as veterans' preferences that do not involve race or gender are subject to rational basis scrutiny, which means that courts will uphold them as constitutional as long as the government has a rational basis for adopting them. On the other hand, preference programs that do involve race or gender are subject to much higher equal protection scrutiny by the courts. Race-based programs are subject to strict scrutiny, which means the particular program must be narrowly tailored to serve a compelling government interest. In other words, they're highly disfavored. In contrast, gender-based programs are subject to intermediate scrutiny, which the Supreme Court has said is much more demanding than rational basis scrutiny, but different than the strict scrutiny that applies to race-based programs. Justice Ginsburg's opinion for the Supreme Court in the VMI case elaborated on what intermediate scrutiny requires. It requires that the government be able to show, in the court's words, an exceedingly persuasive justification for awarding government benefits on the basis of gender. The reason is that these awards, no matter how well-intentioned, grant or deny government benefits on the basis of gender rather than individual abilities or qualifications. Accordingly, the Supreme Court said that although intermediate scrutiny is different than strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny requires the government to show that a gender-based program furthers important governmental interests and that the gender discrimination the program requires is substantially related to achieving those interests. The Justice Department, in reviewing gender programs, adheres to the intermediate scrutiny standard the Supreme Court set forth in VMI and looks to how courts have applied this standard to particular types of gender programs. For contracting programs, federal courts have consistently held that to satisfy intermediate scrutiny, the government must show genuine, non-hypothetical evidence of discrimination in the particular field where the program will operate. I want to point out again that this standard of intermediate scrutiny and the court's focus in gender cases on the government's ability to prove discrimination does not erase the distinction between strict and intermediate scrutiny. The Eleventh Circuit explained the difference this way. While there is a difference in the evidence required to support a race versus gender-based program, the difference is one of degree, not of kind. In both contexts, race and gender, the constitutionality of a government program turns on the adequacy of the government's evidence of discrimination. Intermediate scrutiny just means that in gender cases, less evidence is required. Exactly how much less evidence is not clear from the cases. What is clear is that to survive intermediate scrutiny, a government's gender program must allow the government to show genuine, non-hypothetical evidence of discrimination in the particular field where the program will operate and the cases make clear that mere findings of underrepresentation or disparity are generally not sufficient to satisfy the constitutional standard. The lesson these cases leave for federal agencies implementing gender-based programs is clear. If the agencies want their programs to be upheld as constitutional, the programs must be based on government evidence of discrimination in the particular field where the program will operate. 
That is exactly what the proposed SBA rule requires. It requires that an agency intending to implement a gender-based set-aside program identify as the government evidence of discrimination in the field where the program will operate. It is for that reason that the Justice Department views the proposed rule as consistent with what the Constitution requires under intermediate scrutiny. The rule is also consistent with federal agencies' obligation to implement statutes and programs in a constitutional manner. In order to discharge this obligation, federal agencies can and should take steps to maximize the chances that courts will uphold their programs. Doing so not only helps the agencies comply with the Constitution, it also helps ensure that the programs will survive legal challenges that would otherwise prevent those programs from serving the very people they were intended to benefit. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to taking any questions. Thank you, Ms. Popes. Um, and now uh, I will address my first question with, uh, to Mr. Preston. Uh, Mr. Preston, after seven years, a federal lawsuit and multiple congressional hearings, the SBA puts out a rule that designates for industry as underrepresented. If this proposed rule is finalized, less than 1,300 out of 10 million women-owned businesses will poten potentially benefit from the Women's Procurement Program. It also requires agencies to make a discriminatory finding regarding its past procurement practices, a heavy and unrealistic burden for any cabinet secretary. Once this is implemented, do you believe that it will increase contracts so dramatically that the 5% goal will be achieved? Yeah, uh, first of all, I, I, I want to highlight a couple of the numbers you just mentioned, uh, roughly 1,200 businesses mm -hmm. uh, versus uh, many millions. The 1,200 is not all businesses in these categories. It's all businesses that are registered to do business with the federal government. So that 1,200 you know, relates to about 55,000, granted still about 2%. Uh, uh, we believe it will be an additional tool in their quiver, but we certainly don't think that this is going to be the end all at helping agencies meet their federal goals. And as I, I mentioned in my testimony, uh, we think that uh, uh, federal agencies are going to continue to have to focus on outreach efforts, recruiting no more women into the uh, CCR, uh, uh, and doing, you know, doing the job and really finding uh, the right business for those contracts. Um. Do you believe that the 5% will be achieved? Uh, I believe that a 5% will be achieved someday. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you look at the growth okay. over the last several years, it's been very, very strong. So I think we're on the path. Do you believe it will be achieved this year? Uh, I don't believe it will be achieved okay. this year. Uh, Mr. Preston, we have gone back and examined the numbers. And in order to achieve the 5% goal, each and I know that you mentioned uh, your numbers, but we went back, and based on the data, uh, we found that 1,247 businesses designated as underrepresented will have to receive a contract worth of $4.4 million. This is 10 times the average a small business contract um, get. How likely, on a scale on 1 to 100, with one being absolutely no way, to 100 being absolutely guaranteed that each and every of these um, 1,247 women-owned businesses will receive a contract worth of 4.4%. Four you're, you're presuming uh, that federal dollars. agencies are going to look at four out of 313 categories to increase their contracts with women. Um, and you're presuming that the only way to do that is to go to those categories. Uh, it's a much, much broader opportunity, and I think for agencies to hit those goals, they have to look well beyond those four categories to be effective. Um, the number that I'm mentioning to you will have to correspond to the four categories. And the those four are industries. The increase but let me, let me, I don't agree point. with you. The, and the you one, know that. The $1.5 billion increase we saw in 2006 had nothing to do with set-aside programs. It had everything to do with agencies doing more business with women-owned businesses that were competing effectively. And these firms are competing effectively. And so I think this is an additional tool, but I don't think this is what we can look to to well, expand Mr. our... Well, Mr. Preston, the focus of today's hearing is the Women's Procurement Program. 
Uh, one of the four industries uh, that the SBA designated as underrepresented was national security and international affairs. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. However, the size standard specifies that such contracts cannot be performed by private businesses. Do you know that? Uh, my understanding is that there were private firms in that category, but there were that uh, most of the, f the, the uh, most the of the contracts were classified, so it was difficult for us to get the, detailed it, information. The size standards, Mr. Preston, specifies that such contracts cannot be performed by private businesses. What this means is that it will prevent women-owned businesses and any small business, for that matter, from getting a national security contract. And so I'm appalled. And please explain to me then why the SBA include such an industry in its proposed rule. Uh, this was one of the four industries that was recommended by the Rand Corporation study, uh, and that's why we included it. Section 92. Small business size standards are not established for this sector. Establishment in the public administration sector of federal, state, and local government agency, which administer and oversee government programs and activities that are not performed by private establishments. So what it means is that this industry is out. So we have now three industries where women will be able to participate. So the Small Business Administration had seven years to get this right, and you come back with this product. <coughs> it's just amazing, Mr. President. Your regulation requires an agency to make a discriminatory finding in order to use the program. Has this ever been done before for a congressional, congressionally created affirmative action program? Uh, I don't have the history on that. Uh, my understanding is there's significant precedent in looking at contracting, preferential contracting okay. programs Ms. that Popez, would require that. Can you tell us if an agency finding of discrimination has ever been required before for a similar situated program? Oh, absolutely. And I need a yes or not answer. Yes, absolutely. Uh, multiple federal courts of appeals and multiple federal district courts applying intermediate scrutiny have required exactly that. They've required. Can you provide uh, the, the committee examples of such a. Um, of course, absolutely. Uh, one of the, the examples that I, I mentioned in my opening testimony was. An 11th Circuit case, by the way, all the cases I referred but, to. But, Ms. Popes, I'm asking programs, not court yes, cases. Yes. Programs. Yes, programs. Uh -huh. The court Me cases address programs, women, programs to give women owned businesses contracting preferences. Those are the court cases I was relying on. They, they all deal with the kind of programs we're talking about here. For each agency, you will require? Well, for the government. Yes, uh, I, I mean, what I want for you to mention to us for each agency. Well, a program such as the one that we are discussing today is required for each agency. Well, if by each agency you mean do to do cor do courts require the government agency or entity doing the contract program so to prove discrimination? In, yes, they in do. In the proposed rule, don't you say the federal government? instead of saying each agency has to prove past discrimination. Well, to be clear, I think what the courts require is that there has to be evidence of discrimination in the particular field where the program operates. So it makes sense to say that the agency who's administering the program, they're the agency in the field where the program operates, has to have the evidence of discrimination. That's what all of the cases hold. Do you think what, that what you're stating today is clear in the rule? I think it's clear in the rule that the agency doing the program has to identify evidence of discrimination in the field where the program's going to operate. I think that is clear, and it's, it's absolutely consistent with the cases. But let me ask you, the test that you're putting out is not more consistent with strict scrutiny? No, it is not more consistent. It is the intermediate scrutiny test that the Supreme Court 
and federal courts all over the country have applied to women-owned business contracting programs. It's, it's not a strict scrutiny test that courts apply to, to race. Uh, the, the test that I'm talking about and the test that, that's in the rule is what courts, courts, not the justice, but courts have applied to women-owned business contracting programs across the country. It seems to us that there is a disagreement regarding the test that you're putting out and you feel that that corresponds to intermediate uh, scrutiny. You gonna, and I would like for you to um, state for the record which member of your staff will remain in this committee hearing so that you get the benefit of the second panel uh, we're going to have legal experts here and which totally disagree with uh, the interpretation that you are stating today. Would you please mention the staff of your, uh, the name of your staff that will remain in the committee hearing? Yes, of course, I will stay as long as I personally can. I have a staff member, Mr. Phillips, behind me who will stay in the Justice Department. would be happy to do whatever we can to help resolve this disagreement. We're committed to doing that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Preston. In the preamble to the proposed regulation, the SBA states that RAND provided 28 different approaches to determining which industries are underrepresented by women. The SBA chose one of the narrowest methods to implement the program, even though the National Academies of Sciences recommended that two approaches be used. So I would like to know why did the SBA ignore the National Academy of Sciences in this instance and just use one method? Um, uh, I'd be happy to, but before I mention that, I think we need to reconcile some information because my staff advises me that both small businesses and women-owned small businesses have I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Preston, I'm, I'm not, okay. uh, can you? I, 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 I just want to state for the record here that uh, we need to reconcile some information because my staff has advised me that small businesses and women-owned small businesses have received contract awards under the category that you mentioned, so I would like to make sure that we offer something for the record subsequently. Um, it, I think, you know, if you look at the guidance in the National Academy of Science, uh, they recommend considering a broad number of approaches to get a broad understanding of the issue. However, when you look at the detailed guidance that the National Academy of Sciences provides, they provide, they very specifically uh, uh, mention that monetary awards are critical to compute, that they're preferable because legislatively mandated goals are based on dollars. Dollar value is critical to business success. I understand that, Mr. Preston, but I'm asking okay. you that the Rand Corporation, the uh, company that you hired to do a study, recommended that out of 28, you could use more than one or multiple factors. Okay, uh, the provide, RAND study provided a, a multiplicity of, of, of methodologies, most of which are not defensible, we believe, in this case. There are two concepts, I think, that are clear to understand. The study looks at dollars of contracts because that is the goal we are trying to achieve. They look at underrepresentation based on dollars. The other piece of information they, they use is four-digit industry codes, which are much more detailed, which give us better information on underrepresentation. When you use those two concepts, it winnows it down to two methodologies. And that's, that's it, you know, I can get into more br a broader explanation, but it's as simple as that. Uh, Mr. Preston, it doesn't disturb you that by choosing um, the number of um, dollars amount in terms of contracts given out will only, um, if you use that criteria, it will cover only 3% of, of women that are underrepresented. And if you use it, another method or a combination of more than one, it will show that under, women are underrepresented as high as 80% in some cases. So it doesn't disturb you that disparity between 3% and 80%? Well, I think I can describe for you why that disparity occurs, but what I would tell you is it would be a lot easier for me to stand here and provide you and the rest of the federal agencies with a broad set of set-aside capabilities to meet this goal. But what we did is we determined what we thought was the most accurate depiction 
of what we needed to do to satisfy the statute, the Constitution, and align with the goals. Yeah. I, I think there's some, some things, yeah, I mean. Let you, me ask you, of the 28 methods, do you agree with me that any of those will meet constitutional uh, standards? I, I don't believe certain of them would meet constitutional standards, nor At do I think they're. At least maybe one, two, three, four out of 28. Well, ma'am, let, let me, I mean, if you'd like, I can talk about the number versus dollars issue because you brought it up in your testimony. Uh, when you look at numbers of contracts going to businesses, um, it doesn't look at the dollar value going to them. And let me just draw a comparison. If you have a $5 million business with five $1 million contracts from the federal government, so 100% of their business is from the government, and you have GE with 10 $1 million contracts from the federal government, so they have more contracts, but it's an irrelevant percentage of their revenues. That small business would be considered underrepresented, even though all of their revenue is coming from the federal government. Numbers, you, you have got to adjust for the capacity of the firm and their ability to perform. And numbers puts, you know, sole proprietorships on the same basis as multinationals in terms of the numbers of contracts they're capable of performing. That's why that's not a reasonable comparison. It just frustrated, Mr. <laughs> Mr. President, because what, what I'm asking you is, based on the National Acad Academy of Sciences, which recommended to use more than one method for you to explain why you choose to only use one when there is going to produce such a disparity in terms of the 3% that you're going to achieve by using one method or the 80% in some cases if you have chosen to use a multiple uh, methods. The NAS said that all or most of the methodology should point to underrepresentation. Uh, they also mentioned very specifically that heavier weight should be given to dollars, and they also specifically said that two-digit NAIC codes were too broad to be used as the basis of disparity, which is what the preponderance of these methodologies used. They even said it's too broad. Okay. And if you look at a two-digit, let me just make one more comment. We're looking, if a two-digit NAICS code is, is retailers, when you get to the four-digit, you're looking at automobile, automobile dealerships, grocery stores, jewelry dealers, you know, and if you don't look at a more detailed category, you might say there's underrepresentation in jewelry dealers, and that would lead you to give a preference to auto dealerships. Okay. You have to so look the National Academy of Science is wrong. Mr. We're Preston, exactly I have to, I to, have to uh, leave uh, with Mr. Um, Shabbat. We have a bill on the floor, and Ms. Clark will be chairing this hearing, and I will be coming back as soon as I can. Ms. Fallon, Ms. Dan, you have questions at this time. We yield to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We appreciate you coming today. And, and Ms. Pappas, we appreciate uh, your expertise, knowledge on uh, constitutional issues, and appreciate your uh, explanation of court hearings and Supreme Court rulings. And it's very complicated. So thank you for helping to give us a better understanding of what's going on. And, I think all of us are very concerned about uh, how we can encourage more women to be able to participate in federal government contracting. I certainly know that I've heard from my district back over the many years that I've been in office uh, that women would like to have more opportunities. Uh, but I had a couple of questions, and I had a wonderful briefing by your staff yesterday, so thank you for uh, allowing them to come see me. I had a couple of questions in uh, looking through all the information. What can we do? As a, as a nation to encourage underperforming business categories to register to be on the list so that more women can take advantage of the federal contracts. There seems to be, I, I know back in my district over the years, I would hear women say, I don't know how to do this. And I've heard you say that you're working closer with uh, 
uh, the uh, contract procurement people at various agencies within the SBA to help them coordinate, but it seems like we're still not doing uh, as good of a job as we can be. What can the federal agencies do? Well, first of all, I think we can all continue to participate and expand uh, our outreach efforts by holding forums, uh, by doing match matchmaking sessions where we bring uh, businesses together with federal agencies who procure, uh, and uh, by getting the word out there. And we're working very hard to do that, both by expanding our own physical outreach and making it simpler for people to understand how to do contracting with the federal government through various web tools, through educational sessions that they can get through the SBA website. So it's outreach, it's education. Um, we're also providing the federal agencies with tools to simplify their ability to find the right business. A few months ago, we rolled out a tool where if they put in uh, what they're buying, uh, uh, where they need to buy it, uh, they can basically get a list of all the women-owned businesses that perform that service. So we're helping them find the right small business, which is a brand new opportunity that we've given them. Uh, so it's on a number of fronts, and it's increasing awareness as well. And the last piece, I would say, is holding people accountable. And we rolled out a scorecard last year uh, to hold federal agencies accountable for hitting not only their overall procurement numbers, but for women and other uh, target groups. And I can tell you, that we have gotten more uh, outreach in our direction since we started publishing that information than probably ever before because the agencies do not want uh, to appear like they're not doing the job to support these businesses. So we're trying to hit it on a number of fronts. And, I, and once again, I'd remind the committee, we had the largest increase in the government's history last year in women-owned procurements. So we're on the right track. We just need to continue to do, uh, do more of it. Uh, and, and, and the business, you know, uh, uh, because, you know, we, we believe it's not only good for women-owned businesses, we think it's good for the federal government to have these qualified contractors competing. And if I could clarify, what percentage of women-owned businesses receive, the ones that are registered, actually receive the government, federal government contracts? Uh, last year, it was 3.4 percent of contract revenues compared with a 5 percent goal in 2006, and I would highlight in terms of our own commitment that in 07, SBA will hit almost 25 percent of our contracts. So you we're trying to lead by example here, and we're leading the entire federal government. The other thing is, and I know the chairwoman mentioned a lot of numbers, but when you look at the revenues of small businesses in the economy, the most recent census data shows that women-owned businesses get about 4.2 percent of the revenues of the economy and women-owned small businesses get about 3.4 percent of the revenues in the economy, compared with 3.4 percent from the federal government. So we're work, you know, we're working within that body of businesses to get those revenues. And I think it's important to make that distinction because we're comparing the numbers of firms with the dollars they get, and that's not the relevant comparison. We need to look at the capacity to perform versus the dollars that we have to give out. You know, the percentage of women-owned businesses in the United States, what percentage of those women actually register to get the federal contracts? Oh, it would be a very small percentage. Uh, it would be a fraction of 1 percent. Now, when you look at the 18 million businesses, women-owned businesses in the United States, probably half of those uh, are, uh, you know, are, are one-woman shops. They don't have employees. Uh, and then the, the preponderance of the rest of them are, are relatively small. Uh, uh, so. Uh, it's a very small number, but I think if you looked at all businesses, of, other businesses of comparable size, you'd also sign, find a very small percentage. That having been said, it means that there's also a large group of businesses out there for us to go to as we look at recruiting them. And Madam Chairman, if I could ask one last question. Was the SBA removed from the process as far as being independent from the RAND study? Oh, yes. Uh, what we did with RAND is we conveyed to them the guidelines that were given to uh, them by the National Academy of Science. And as, as many of you know, because it's been a long journey, uh, the original study the SBA did was deemed to be uh, uh, not defensible. So we went to the National Academy of Sciences and said, how does a study have to look to be defensible here? They laid out a methodology. The SBA conveyed that methodology to RAND, and RAND followed the methodology. Uh, and the agency pulled very much back from the analytical process and left it to the experts uh, because we wanted to ensure that we had a third party, uh, unbiased in any way, performing that analysis. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chairman. 
Thank you. I now yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Sestak. Thank you very much. Um, the arguments, which I understand um, for why your position is, remind me of um, some civil arguments I heard over the last 30 years. But there's an institution of the U.S. government that understood that there was a national interest, an important interest, which I think the engineering versus metro metropolitan Dade case established for gender discrimination. And that organization, the federal government, said we really do need women to be more represented. So the U.S. military actually set goals for promotion boards, not the same as this legislation does, that needed to be achieved. Now, the arguments that I heard prior to this were not dissimilar. I mean, everybody took every position they could of the old timers to prevent them <coughs> from becoming and in, getting into combat roles. And I can remember being off Afghanistan the first night and this young 27-year-old woman pilot diving down as we went into the air and trying to salvage four special forces that had died and got the other four out. But I never understood when I listened to you today why was that unconstitutional? I mean, we do it today. We have goals that so many women should be promoted into these combat positions and, and all. I'm sorry, is the question addressed to me? Yes, it is. And second is, when you set the standard that you have, it's a great block, frankly. And yet, the military does it every day. And I've never heard the administration take a differing position. Well, and so m if I could, when you go down and look at the Metropolitan case, they actually say societal discrimination in the economic sector is sufficient for the government to prove discrimination. Why are you putting a higher standard than that court said? The third court refers to the Ansley Branch case. Why are you now making a higher standard well, of, of having to prove direct discrimination than what the court already said? Societal discrimination is sufficient. Uh, I guess th there are a lot of parts to your question, so let me try to take them uh, piece by piece. Uh, first, I just want to say the Justice Department is not uh, setting any standards here. We reviewed a rule consistent with case law, so I want to say that at the outset. Secondly, uh, I don't and recall shouldn't saying... We, but shouldn't we, as the Justice Department, then say the military's acting against the Constitution? Because one of your arguments was, we don't want the agencies to set off on a wrong course here and be pulled back. It appears to me you've got an agency, Department of Defense, that's evidently on the wrong course. Why haven't we pulled them back? But if we're preventing well something from happening right, here. If, if, I could, if I could answer that, first of all, I want to say... I don't recall ever saying in the Justice or the Justice Department ever saying that anyone has acted unconstitutionally. So I'm not really sure where that part of your question comes from. I mean, we're not saying that anybody is acting unconstitutionally uh, here. No, I guess what you're saying is if you do not, if you don't do this direct discrimination evidence, the uh, intermediate level, that you won't be held constitutionally valid. It will be against the Constitution. Well, because of court cases, and my argument is, well, it seems to me we got an agency over here that's doing exactly that. Well, I, I, first of all, I don't know exactly the details of the program you're talking about. Secondly, I would say... It's a goal. It actually goal. actually says, and we go to promotion boards there, 5%, that's our goal of how many women we want promoted. Right, it's a goal, not a and requirement. And, then and that's what this is. 5% here for women-owned businesses is a goal. It's not a requirement. Right, and so I think... But what's the difference? Well, I think the same standard applies, and it's the standard I said. So you know, we should be over at DOD telling them that they're not... that's unconstitutional? Not at all. I don't think that's, that's the case. It's the same program that you're trying to defend here, ma'am. But I haven't said any program is unconstitutional. The point is a simple one. It is that if the government wants to do all it can to ensure that a court will uphold a program as constitutional and not strike it down, and I would point out... But why haven't the court struck this down as unconstitutional? We've been doing it for decades or, or so. Well, Wh first of why all, all of a sudden are you hiring a higher stricture than the government already holds on a similar program? 
Well, I guess, I don't, again, I don't know exactly what DOD program you're talking about. One DOD program I do know about is the DOD program that's been at issue tied up in litigation in the Rothy case for almost 10 years. And I guess if your question is, well, why hasn't court, a court struck down or upheld the particular program you're talking about, again, I don't know the details. I would All right, well, could you go then to the next question? It just bemuses me because I heard so many old timers over those decades say, we, we just don't need women in combat roles. But it sort of like sounds to me, we, we, we don't need that many women to try to interpret this easy, more easily for women to get a fair share. So my second question has, why are you setting what appears to me a higher standard of proving direct discrimination rather than evidence of societal discrimination in the economic sector? I'd li I would really like to address that. First, I want to say no one is disputing. I think we all share the goal that we want to encourage more women in contracting. No one is trying to block them. And is the, the Weed Justice Department or that one should have been addressed to Mr. Preston? I mean, it seems to me Chairwoman Velasquez's comments were spot on. I mean, you could have taken any of the measures because the law did not specify the amount of money. And so it wasn't, it's unfair to you. That question was really to him. Uh, combined is you want the amount of money rather than the number of contracts. But anyway, if you would go back to the societal issue, yeah, right? let me talk about that. I mean, when you know when you talk about the Justice Department advising on rules and these constitutional standards, we do that because we are trying really hard to help agencies make sure that these programs are upheld, that the programs that are helping these women are upheld and not struck down. So that's why we're doing it. We are, we're doing it because we want these programs to be right and we want them but to But why didn't them. you say the bar was societal discrimination? That's a lower standard than direct discrimination, correct? Yeah, but I didn't talk, uh, I didn't say direct discrimination or societal. I said, like the cases say, that it, in order to sustain a program, the government must show evidence of discrimination in the relevant sector. That is what I said, and that's what the cases require. Now, your point is some cases, like the ECA case, have said that evidence of societal discrimination may be enough to sustain a program. I would point out in the uh, ECA case, the court actually struck down the Actually, it said it edition. can be satisfied by society, not may. There was no may in that hearing. Can be. Can, may, doesn't mean it must necessarily be or it is. It can or may if the evidence is sufficient. What I would point out is in that very case, the court struck down the program, the women's contracting program at issue, because the evidence was not sufficient. And where justice comes from is we look at cases like that and we advise agencies that if you don't want your program to be struck down like that one was, you need to have good robust evidence the courts will accept to uphold the program. It's not in the agency's interest or in women's interest to have courts strike these programs down, and that's what that ECA court did. It struck it down. Yeah, but it struck it down because they had not attempted to show societal discrimination. Uh, so if they had come back, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Th that I'm I, I hate to say that, but uh, you, are, you are wrong in that case. They did try to show it, and the court held the evidence, which was a disparity study, was insufficient evidence. So they tried to show it through a disparity study, akin to Rand, and the court said, that's not good enough. But if I could, does not inter, and I'm not a lawyer, I'm just a seaman, but if an intermediary, uh, an intermediate, is that what it's called, uh, discrimination, doesn't that require direct discrimination finding? Uh, no, uh, uh, the courts haven't said that, and the Justice Department hasn't said that. It doesn't require direct versus indirect, it requires evidence of so discrimination. So societal is enough. It may be enough, depending on the strength of the evidence. All right. That's what courts have held. Courts have held that societal discrimination may be enough, depending on the strength of the evidence. And in ECA, the court held that a disparity study was not good enough evidence of discrimination to qualify the program. Can we then, uh, either you or staff, I'd like to know and then go through the military program, which has similar goals as that does. Why is that OK? and what's different about it, well, that evidently what you speak about has not been a part of what the U.S. government's agencies have tried to also lay down as requirements for the agency to be concerned or aware about. I actually they think they that. have. I mean, again, I don't, I don't know what specific defense program you're talking about. The one I know a, a fair amount about, because it's been in litigation, is the 1207 DOD program, which has race and gender preferences, and it's been tied up in litigation for years on precisely the issues I was talking about, which is that people were coming in and saying, we don't think that these preferences DOD is giving to contracts are constitutional because... No, they're not kind of... It's promotion of women from lieutenant to lieutenant commander. 
that's a different, what I'm talking about is a different program. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm it's not just purely promotions. And, you know, I mean, same thing, trying to get more representation, I've gone over my limit, more representation of women into the upper ranks. And so goals were set. You know, same thing, but, you know, same thing, it's gender-based. And it was not, and we've been doing it for years. And so I'm curious why in this one we're so concerned to make sure the agencies don't get caught up, you know, that they can work their way through constitutional issues. But over there, on a very similar program, it seems as though they're going along for what is a national interest good. I've gone on too long. I yield back. I'm sorry. If I could just say briefly for the record, I, I'm not familiar with the military promotions program. I, th I think there, there are probably some real differences between that and the contracting program. And all of the evidence and testimony that I've been presenting today is specific to contracting programs, although we would be happy to look at the military program and provide it any answers that might, uh, might I, help the committee. If, if I would be interested because there seems to be such commonality of more gender-based, you know, representation. The principle seems to be the same. And when I hear the other side of the argument here, I kind of look at the old Navy admirals that didn't want them at the top and picked the right measure to make sure they didn't get in there. So thank you very much. Ms. Ms. Arono from Hawaii, yield. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question, or several questions, for um, Mr. Preston. You know in your uh, testimony that the proposed rule, about a proposed rule, and I take it that the proposed rule doesn't uh, insulate the agencies from uh, being challenged on constitutional grounds when they award contracts to women-owned small businesses, correct? I'm sorry, could you restate the question? It doesn't do what? I'm saying the rule does not completely or even partially insulate the agencies from legal and constitutional challenge. No, the, um, the, the agency has to undertake its own review. So have they been doing that? Have they set up, established a, it says, framework to make the determination as to um, justifiable discrimination so that they can award these contracts no, the, to women-owned businesses? The, the agency would need to look at the facts and circumstances within their agency. Uh, which may vary dramatically from one agency to another uh, and from one business category to another. Uh, and that's why, because of those uniquenesses, it doesn't set out a, a specific framework uh, in sort of a one-size-fits-all fashion. I realize that, but the agencies uh, have, all of the agencies have particular types of contracts uh, that, that they are awarding, and so they need to justify, just in case yeah. uh, someone decides to challenge, they need to uh, lay out their rationale. So have they uh, uh, done that, pro you know, Prospectively, in, uh, yeah, in uh, anticipation I, uh, of I don't legal know challenges. What, I don't, I don't know what they have done. We haven't, <coughs> we haven't asked them for uh, uh, a description of what, how they would do it. Uh, certainly, in the process of the proposed rule, uh, if people bring forward ideas on that issue, uh, uh, we will consider them in the rulemaking process. I think that, that that is an area that you probably should, um, if I can make a suggestion, you yeah. probably should proceed with because it is uh, it should be anticipated that these challenges will come forward, especially with, based on the Supreme Court decisions and the circuit court decisions. So you know two areas that you are moving toward. Uh, one, one is to increase the number of women-owned businesses that are registered. Um, and I take it that, that the registration is a, a simple thing for women-owned businesses to do, that we don't have a lot of barriers for them to uh, register themselves? No, there, is no, there aren't a lot of barriers uh, for them to register themselves. I would tell you that participating in the entire federal contracting process has its own challenges just because of federal rules, and, uh, and right. clearly they have to um, uh, make sure they're aware of those and, and uh, comply with those, which is you know, somewhat of a higher hurdle. Well, than that's outside different the from. I government. think registration is I, your, uh, your is your easier challenge. I, I would I think. I agree with you. Yeah, because absolutely. then you have all these thousands of businesses that are registered, and unless they know what to do once they've registered, it's just buns on seats. And so right. that's the second part of your task. That's so what right. I'm sa the and second part being the educating and helping them yeah, actually get these contracts. And, and I mentioned uh, 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 some new technology we have. Once they're registered, we have the ability to find them very simply based on the industries they compete in and mm -hmm. their locations. 
Um, so uh, uh, it is important for us to get them in there to help the other agencies find them. That's right. But I see the, the larger problem as making sure that your these agencies you want to you want to encourage them to give these contracts to small w women owned small businesses but they're not going to do that if they're going to have to face a legal challenge every time they do that so i think the larger challenge is for you to really help them right. establish the uh, make the be able to sustain a legal challenge and and i don't see that as part of your yeah, may I, make w I just want right to emphasize now, one, I'm one concept. Suggesting that it be okay. I, I, I want to make one comment. The the only uh, issue with respect to legality here has to do with an agency that chooses to do a set aside uh, for only women-owned small businesses in one of those four industry categories, which is a uh, as we've all acknowledge it's a relatively small percentage of the overall contracting pie, and only once again if it's set aside to the exclusion of other businesses. With respect to the overall contracting picture, where you know 99% plus of the revenue base is, those uh, types of justifications are irrelevant because women-owned businesses would be going to the table competing against other small businesses. The other thing I would mention is in our 8A program, about 30% of those companies are women-owned, and women represent a significant portion of the hub zone program uh, and overall small businesses. So they, there are set-aside possibilities in those categories. Uh, but they would be competing against okay. non-women-owned small businesses in those cases, and those would not be subjected to legal challenges. Uh, I take well, it. If, uh, if if it's it's only the instance where it's just going to be um, women-owned small businesses that can qualify for the particular contract that raises a potential constitutional challenge. Yes, That's specifically in those four categories for set asides, I would tell you that there are ongoing cases that are challenging the constitutionality of of uh, of our other programs. Um, but uh, uh, I think that's a different issue than that's what you're probably asking. a different constitutional yes. standard. So then, and uh, now that you ex if you've explained that, then what percentage of all of your agency's contracts are uh, in the, the the category where constitutional challenges could arise based on gender? Uh, oh, the gender uh, it's issue. less than one percent would than be 1%. in these categories, uh, and once again, only if it's a set aside. Which I think is the concern that chair, the chair uh, uh, raised is because of the small number of categories. Is there a possibility of increasing the, the, this 1 percent to more than that to give, uh, basically to really focus on uh, yes. women? Own small yeah, there is. I, I, one of the challenges in the RAND study is there were a number of cases where they found um, that there was not enough statistical evidence to really dig into it. For example, there might not have been any women signed up for those categories. There may have only been a few federal contracts going to those categories. And I think it will be important for the, the SBA to continue to review those categories to see if they are significant enough to matter. Uh, and if there is additional uh, activity coming into those categories, um, that would enable us to do a re review to determine underrepresentation. The other thing which we mentioned in this study is I think periodically it will be incumbent upon the SBA to update its findings to determine uh, 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 whether or not there's a change uh, and whether or not the categories could be expanded. So that is, I believe, a task that we will have uh, going into the future. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you very much, <clears throat> uh, Madam Chair. My first question will go to the administrator, and I'm going to read from a story from the uh, the Post, January 7th, and, and see if you can respond to this concern expressed by a certain individual. Uh, the quote: "The government's recent preference for hiring one large company to manage several smaller projects also makes the idea of capping individual projects at three million dollars." unfeasible, said Faye Coleman, president of Westover Consultants in Bethesda. Uh, and I'm sure that you've addressed it, and I apologize for getting here late. We're, you know, we're starting the second session, 110th, and we're spread out all over the place. But I'm sure what Ms. Coleman is concerned about is that you already have a problem with bundling out there. And is this just basically an accommodation or incentive for further practice and or expanding what procurement officers are already doing? which will basically shut out women-owned businesses by capping it at three. I mean, does it work that way, or am I just totally wrong, and you can give me some other read on it? Well, the $3 million, uh, 
that's in the rule is based on the statute that was passed. Uh, uh, so the three million in the rule, we've only you know implemented it to mirror the statute, and that's why it's in there. Uh, the other thing I would mention is on the $3 million, once again, that only relates $3 million for service, I think $5 million for manufacturers, mm -hmm. only relates to the ability to do set-asides, not for the ability for those people to compete for businesses, for business. So it doesn't mean that these businesses can't compete for 5 or $10 million contracts. It would only mean that those would not be available. Well, we're the talking set about set-asides, aren't we? Right. Well, let's just, <laughs> we'll leave it at set-asides then. That was her concern. And I understand you're, you're pointing something out that's very important. If that's part of a reg, if it's part of a rule, you're bound by the three million. It's part of the statute that and you that's passed. Exactly. That I'm just saying if that restricts you, you need to b let us know so that we understand right. how it may mitigate and actually work against the very thing that we're attempting to accomplish. Because believe me, we have serious problems with bundling already. Whether it's 8A or it's going to be 8M, it doesn't matter. The whole problem is that they cannot compete because we have contracting and procurement officers out there that intentionally bundle these things because they really just want to deal with one big ball of wax rather than maybe ten moving parts, which we all understand is human nature, but it frustrates what we attempt to do, and that's why Chairwoman Velasquez's scorecard for governmental agencies and departments usually amount to nothing more than maybe a lot of D's, a lot of F's, and maybe a C here uh, and there. My next question would go to Miss, is, is it Pappas? How P do you? Papez. Papez. Um, and I, I just, let me, the good thing, and you're a lawyer, and, and the wonderful thing for members of the committee is that we have staff that will prepare memos uh, that really do explain where we are, at least with the situation. and give us uh, some guidance. I'm going to read from the memo. Um, the SBA has proposed that in order for an agency to set aside a new contract, the procuring agency would have to conduct an appropriate analysis of its own procurement history to show that there has been discrimination against women-owned small businesses in the past. Is that correct? Um, I, I think, yeah, the rule generally requires that the agency that would be administering a set-aside program has to find discrimination in the relevant field, which is the area where that agency is going to administer contracts. So where does societal discrimination, as my colleague Mr. Sestek pointed out, where does that come into play? Because if we're really going to restrict it to what's going on in that particular arena, to that particular agency, to that particular product or service, then what happens with the bigger picture of what we're really trying to address as a societal issue, as a societal problem? reducing it to a specific instance here. Does that simply is not a consideration? It's really not a factor? I mean, they should just basically stay within their own purview, their own little universe, and say, well, what our agency does and how we conduct our business is not discriminatory, one, within, again, in another, uh, what I'd say, s <laughs> I don't know if it's a subsection of a subsection of a subsection as far as the type of business product or service in which they're dealing. Is that where we find ourselves today? It's, it's, that's a very good question. I'm glad you asked it because th this goes to something that is a tough issue uh, in these kind of programs and it goes to the cases um, that your colleague mentioned also. Um, I, I'm not going to say that, that societal discrimination isn't a factor um, because I, I don't think I, I need to say that or it's appropriate to say. I think what, what I would say is the rule talks about agency findings of discrimination in the area where they do government contracts because that's what the cases uh, are going to hold the agency to in order to get the program to pass muster and specifically what these cases have said including the Supreme Court is the government in this case the agency that's doing the contract program has got to show evidence of discrimination in this is the court's words the particular field where the contract program is going to operate and so that particular field is going to be the field where that agency is given out government contracts. And the reason that the rule tells agencies, line up your evidence of discrimination in your area where you do um, contracts is because that's what courts are going to require. And, and I would point out in that ECA case uh, that I was talking about a few minutes ago, it's an 11th Circuit case in Florida. It, it involved a women-owned uh, contracting program administered by the state to benefit women-owned businesses, and um, they contended that societal discrimination was indeed relevant, 
and they tried to sustain the program based on it. They had a disparity study, and they were saying, look, women are underrepresented. You know, the government, the state of Florida had, and the county has an important interest in trying to help women out. They've been underrepresented. They've suffered societal discrimination. We want to help them. Here's our program to do it. And they put forth that evidence, and the court struck the program down. It said that's not good enough evidence under intermediate scrutiny. So what I'm saying is we at Justice, we look at cases like that, and when we look at a rule, we say, okay, what should the rule say that agencies uh, need to do in structuring these programs in a way that's going to get them upheld? Because that's what, that's what the real end game is here. I don't think it's in Congress's interest or the administration's interest to see these programs struck down. So, you know, sort of long story short, it's not that anyone's saying societal discrimination is irrelevant um, at all. The rule just simply reflects what the courts have been requiring the government and in these cases, you know, the agency that's doing the contracting program to show. It seems to me, then, that there's no application for societal uh, discrimination factor. I, I don't know that that's true. I mean, I think so. I mean, we're, when, fine, okay, ex give me an example of where you might have an agency, or, or an agency or a department rely on societal discrimination as a factor to maybe carry the day before the court. I'm in a certain sector. I'm an agency or a department that deals in a certain product or service. Give me an instance where I might be able to bring into the legal argument societal discrimination. I think I'd, I, I guess the best uh, and hardest, most concrete example I can give you is that ECA case where uh, the government doing the contracting program relied on evidence of societal discrimination. The evidence they had was a disparity study. Court said that wasn't enough because the disparity study didn't do regression analyses and other things that backed out the disparity and linked it up to discrimination. And the court seemed to suggest that if the study had done that, in other words, instead of just saying there's disparity or underrepresentation, uh, it can link it up to specific discrimination. And the, the court, I guess, left open that that discrimination could have been maybe from society or the government um, if the study had, had gotten into that level of, of proof of discrimination. And again, the court left it open. Maybe it's societal, maybe it's, um, maybe it's government discrimination, but at the end of the day, you're linking up the disparity to discrimination. Uh, it might have upheld it. So that's, I guess, a, a court case and a fact pattern that says uh, the government could uh, convince a court that it's got sufficient evidence of discrimination in the relevant sector by pointing to societal discrimination, but they've got to show discrimination and related to the disparity in the government contracting sector. And they've got to do that with, you know, statistics and hard evidence, not just with, with arguments or hypotheses. Do you believe as a society there's still discrimination being practiced against women? Again, gender bias and prejudice and discrimination in business enterprises. Um, Use an individual. You know, I, I think that's entirely possible. Um, oh, know. it's way more than possible. You know, you, you, don't, you don't really, because I'm going to get eventually to my, my last question. Uh, this is only my second question. This is, again, I'm going to read from the memo. Furthermore, the Metropolitan Dade case cites the Third Circuit case for Ensley Branch, which states that the discrimination offered as evidence need not be governmental discrimination. In that case, the court found that, quote, one of the distinguishing features of intermediate scrutiny is that unlike strict scrutiny, the government interest prong of the inquiry can be satisfied by a showing of societal discrimination in the relevant economic sector. This suggests that the level of scrutiny required by the SBA in its proposed rule is beyond what is required under current case law. Is, is that an accurate statement? by um, staff that prepared the memo? I do not think it's accurate to say that um, the SBA rule goes beyond what's, um, uh, what's required by intermediate scrutiny. I would say, and I think I just said a couple minutes ago, including under that ECA case, that uh, we're not saying that soci evidence of societal discrimination doesn't have a place here. Uh, that's not at all what we're saying. And what I explained in talking about the ECA case and how a court might find evidence of societal discrimination to be good enough is where, you know, the government can link up that kind of evidence of discrimination to the underrepresentation in the government contracting field. You know, and, and, and I think that's, that's clearly what the cases stand for. Um, you know, I think what your question goes to, and maybe the committee generally looked at this rule and said, 
wait a second, uh, you know, isn't this rule making it sort of harder than necessary? And if your question is, aren't, are there cases out there that suggest that a program might be able to survive on something less than what the rule is requiring? Um, I think, yeah, there, there are some cases out there that may suggest that, but the body of the case law under inter intermediate scrutiny, and even those cases, are all clear about one thing. The government has to prove discrimination. So if the issue is, is it okay to just go ahead with a set-aside program based on a disparity study that doesn't lick up to evidence of discrimination, um, that's not going to pass muster, and I would, you know, I don't think it's advisable for an agency to proceed on that basis. Have you ever ad advanced uh, any argument relying on the societal discrimination factor? Um, not alone, but in conjunction with specific uh, practices within that agency or department's own practices when it comes to the a specific service or product. When you say you, do you mean the Justice Department or? I'm just saying in in your in your memorandums or uh, brief anything that you would even provide in the way of guidance to the to the uh, administration to the Small Business Administration as they attempt to promulgate certain rules governing this particular program. I mean, do you ever have a discussion about societal discriminatory practices? that might come into play that would be relevant to substantiate and support whatever SBA would do in trying to meet their obligation under 8M? Well, that's exactly what we do in discussing these cases. I mean, that's, you know, when we look to the cases and try to explain, you know, what an agency would have to show to have their program upheld. And so you do touch on the big picture, societal discrimination is something that they would be able to try to show or establish to support whatever SBA efforts might be. Certainly we highlight that, that courts do look to, like the EC case, it, societal discrimination is a relevant factor. The, the thing that we go on to point out, though, is that the ultimate test is, is your set-aside program um, furthering you know, government interests, and do you have evidence of discrimination in the area where the program is going to operate? So if the area where the program is going to operate is an area of government contracting where the government's the actor, um, we also caution, because courts have done it, that the government ultimately bears the burden of showing discrimination in that sphere. So the, if the government's going to rely on societal discrimination, they, they better be able to link that up to discrimination in the contracting sphere. I, I, I don't know okay. if Okay. And, and you know what, though? I, I think you've touched on it. There is no relevance when it comes to societal discriminatory practices unless you have a specific discriminatory practice occurring in that, by that particular agency in in whatever it's doing in its procurement practices on, on its products and services, which means, and as a lawyer you know this, you can throw out societal discrimination. I guess it has no application. And that's what I really want. I don't want to deal in fictions. I do not want to deal in fictions. I don't think the courts are dealing in fictions. What I think, the courts are sending out a message to all you lawyers out there saying, bring back these arguments. Let us develop them. And I'm going to leave you with one final thought. And, and I understand, look, you have a job to do, and as a lawyer, you want to give advice to SBA that whatever they do will survive judicial scrutiny because someone is going to contest it. Believe me, I know that's important. But you are still an advocate and a representative, indirectly, of women, of women, and all the programs that we attempt to effectuate through legislation such as, as 8M or 8A, whatever we may have. But I'll never forget, there was a wonderful old lawyer named Judge Curry in San Antonio, and we'd be up there arguing a case, and we would have the controlling case authority. And then he would rule against it. And we'd say, but Judge Curry, Smith versus Jones stands for the very opposite uh, proposition. You know what Judge Curry would say? I'm going to give the appellate courts another chance to get it right. And you, know, I, and you really need a, uh, we used to think that was outrageous as lawyers. You know what? Judge Curry was right. Because sooner or later, they overturned old precedent because society moved on and it was reflected more than, often than not by the judicial branch of our government. And, and that's the beauty of it. I mean, I think you represent actually both. But when it's all said and done, it will be some judge up there that will decide that we need to move forward as a society. So I'm just going to say, still look at the societal discriminatory practices as a relevant factor, 
and I, I hope that we're totally wrong that it, it really is not that relevant. And I yield back and thank you for your indulgence, Madam Chair. If I may just respond very briefly to say that, again, uh, we do not serve women or programs that benefit them by advising agencies to implement them in a way that courts are going to strike down. I would also say that I did not take the position, nor does the Justice Department, that in Judicial challenges, evidence of societal discrimination is irrelevant. That is not the position we've taken. What we've said is if agencies are going to rely on that, under the case law, they've got to link it up to discrimination in their agency contracting field in order for the program to be upheld, which is really what everybody wants at the end of the day. And the final thing I would say is the U.S. Supreme Court very recently, it's not an old precedent, confirmed the intermediate scrutiny standards that I'm talking about and that the rule reflects, and I would say that I don't think the Supreme Court, and I certainly hope they don't decide, thinks that this country should move on from the equal protection standards that must be satisfied in these cases, but should be satisfied and should not for policy preferences or even the most well-intentioned policy reasons, <laughs> depart from basic constitutional protections that have protected both sides of this question for a very long time in a way that has really benefited women. The Constitution, and I mean, we're going to go on and on on this thing, but the whole point is the way the Constitution and its protections have been interpreted and passed have not been truly probably the most admirable way of doing it. Society has moved forward because brave lawyers and judges have been able to give true life to the words and spirit of the written word. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm trying to discuss with you here. And I know that you keep telling me that societal discriminatory, discriminatory practices are relevant, but in your answers, you're still telling me. You're going to tell your client that that's lofty and wonderful, but if it doesn't have a specific application when it comes to your interpretation of interme intermediate uh, scrutiny on what they're doing specifically within their own department, within their own product, with their own service, it doesn't matter. So if I'm on the receiving end of that legal advice, where do you think I'm going to go with this? Well, I didn't say it doesn't matter. I never said that. What I said is, and it's not my standard or the Justice Department standard, I said if an agency wants their program to be upheld by the courts, and that's what everyone should want because it doesn't benefit women to have these things struck down. What I said was, if you're going to rely on societal evidence of discrimination and courts will look to it and they'll let you rely on it, you got to link it up because if you don't, your program's going to go the way of the 11th Circuit case program. It's going to get struck, and that doesn't benefit anybody. Thank you very much. Uh, will the gentleman yield? Oh, I, I yield back. Will you yield for me for one second? Right. Yes. Uh, I, I want to ask a question, Mr. Preston. Uh, Mr. Preston, you, the AI program <laughs> is the most challenged program in the federal gro uh, government. It has been challenged in court. It's the last affirmative action program that exists in the federal government. Are you required to admit, admit past discrimination in order to award contracts under the 8A program? Uh, yes or no? Frankly, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, uh, frankly, what the uh, judicial or uh, history is for supporting discrimination. I'm asking program. you today. As the administrator of SBA, this is a program that exists under SBA statute. Yeah. Is it required, it's required to admit past discrimination in order to uh, award grants, uh, contracts? It's uh, required for us to show social disadvantage and economic okay. disadvantage. And uh, social disadvantage, I Ms. think, Propress, is closely related. Before I ask you to give me an example, programs in the federal government that will have to prove past discrimination? Yes. You didn't answer my question. Well, I want to ask which programs and agencies? Oh, well, 8A is certainly one. They it's not. It, it, it is. It I mean, is not. It, it actually, it is. I mean, in the, in the Rothy case, the, the Texas case that just came down in Rothy says that, and the Supreme Court has said that. I mean, any program that awards benefits based on race or gender um, requires the government to show evidence of discrimination. So in the are you telling area. me each agency has to go through this in order to award uh, the ADA contracts, uh, prog uh, contracts in their agencies? Well, I guess it, uh, maybe I was confused on the question. You're saying are there programs that have to show past discrimination? And I'm saying yes, all race and gender programs have to do that. If your question is agency-specific 
admissions of past discrimination. Is that what you're you're asking yes. about? Yes. Yes. I think. I guess if the question is, do agencies have to admit past discrimination? I think if they do, they would certainly uh, pass constitutional scrutiny. Uh, I don't know that they have to do that in order to pass s constitutional scrutiny. But I would say also, it, no, if, if I may, though, I think this is mm -hmm. partly, I think, I, I get the sense that part of the frustration that the committee is feeling, and I, I think what I understood you to be saying before, um, before you left for the break was, the committee looked at this rule and said, wait a second, what's going on here? This rule is requiring individual agencies to find discrimination when we've already got a disparity what study. What I'm saying is that for gender-based program, it will be necessary to f uh, demonstrate that there is past discrimination when do you do not require minority programs to do so. That's, that's the whole issue here. And now I recognize Mr. Chavez. Uh, if Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Mr. Preston, let me start with you if I can. Um, I know there's considerable frustration in the seven years, how long this is taking to implement, et cetera. Um, how, how much, if any, of the delay uh, in implementing the program is attributable uh, to trying uh, to make sure that it will ultimately withstand constitutional muster? Well, I think uh, the long and storied past of this rule uh, is exactly based on that. Uh, the SBA, I think, after the 2000 uh, uh, statute was passed, very quickly conducted a, uh, uh, an under, uh, a study of underrepresentation. And uh, as part of the interagency review, it was determined that somebody on the outside basically needed to look at this to determine whether or not it was adequate. That's when that went over to the National Academy of Sciences. And the National Academy of Science basically said, this will not. It's not uh, it, 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 for a number of reasons, which we can go into. Uh, the National Academy of Science then laid out a detailed methodology for what would uh, be sufficient uh, for a program of this nature. And then that methodology went over to RAND. And RAND uh, uh, took, obviously, a period of time to actually do the analytical work to write it up and present it to us. So the entire pathway is one of trying to get this right. And as you've uh, yeah, heard from Ms. Pepez and, and, and other people, uh, these are very complex issues and uh, require a great deal of uh, solid foundation to be able to uh, uh, ensure that this is sustained. Thank you. Ms. Pepez, I assume you agree with that. And is there anything that you would like to add uh, to that? I would. Thank you. I very much appreciate the opportunity. And this partly goes back to the chairwoman's question. I want to make a, a distinction here. I mean, the law and the Constitution require government proof of discrimination in both race and gender programs. So from the standpoint of the law and the Constitution, discrimination would have to be shown for 8A programs and 8M. I think what the chairwoman may have been getting at is that the language of the federal rules implementing these programs may not say the same things about exactly what an agency has to do. Um, that may be, I, I don't have the rules on 8A in front of me, but just because uh, an administration rule um, in an 8A versus 8M program doesn't use the exact same language on agency findings doesn't mean that there are different legal standards or that discrimination is not required in both. Thank you. Um, Mr. Preston, um, irrespective of the outcome of the rulemaking, um, what efforts is the SBA taking to get more women small business uh, owners to register with uh, the central contract registry or otherwise get involved in the federal procurement process? Uh, very significant outreach efforts through our, our network. We have about 100 locations around the country. We hold uh, events uh, to bring in people to teach them about federal contracting, to introduce them to per, uh, purchasers uh, within the federal contracting arena so they can actually connect with the contracts. Uh, we're providing educational tools uh, on the website. Uh, we've retrained our entire field organization, uh, uh, over 1,000 people, to enable them to provide better training uh, and support to small businesses when they come in. We've redirected the PCRs, which are, the, which are uh, procurement center representatives uh, that work for the SBA that actually sit at other agency procurement activities. Uh, they are focusing not only entirely now on those contracts, but we've also uh, rolled out a new program where even when they look at small business set-asides, they will be working with the individual agencies to ensure that they're meeting their goals 
for uh, preference groups within small business, and uh, women-owned small businesses is, is one of the targeted categories for them to, uh, to work with. So, uh, and we continue to expand it. So these are very real, uh, very tangible initiatives that we think will continue to drive that number forward. Thank you. And uh, also, given the fact that the ultimate authority for utilizing the program rests uh, with contracting officers, what actions will the SBA take to educate contracting officers about the program? We have uh, uh, a very consistent process of meeting with all the other federal agencies on uh, any new rules, any new processes. We get, we, uh, get their input. Uh, uh, you know, we have dramatically expanded our coordination efforts with the other agencies in a number of ways. So. Uh, I think, and they, they are very much apprised of the progress on this rule and what they're going to be required to do. Thank you. Um, have you determined who in the SBA will be involved in interacting with other uh, federal agencies in the development of the final rule? Yeah, there are a number of people, and uh, frankly, this is uh, an issue that uh, uh, my deputy uh, is very engaged with directly and in sharing those meetings with the other agencies. So I, we have a very senior person at the agency uh, uh, focused on it all the way at the deputy level, and then we also have a new head uh, associate administrator for government contracting and business development named Faye Ott, who will be the primary contact person and primary uh, driver of the implementation of the rule. Thank you. And my final question um, with you is uh, typically the SBA uh, will only consider comments filed after the deadline uh, if it's uh, able to do so without delaying the rulemaking. Will the SBA consider late filed comments in this proceeding uh, given the potential controversy associated uh, with the rulemaking? I, I think if we find that there is uh, the possibility of a lot of additional comments coming in, uh, what we would like to do is extend the comment period, and we've done that in a number of other situations. This has uh, is a rule that obviously has some very complex legal issues uh, and analytical issues associated with it, so uh, we would certainly be open, open to uh, expanding that period if we believe it will be helpful in getting more comments in. Okay. Uh, thank you. And Ms. Pappas, uh, finally, um, because of the chairwoman and myself being called over the floor and having to handle a, a different uh, bill, we weren't here to hear all the questions that may have been uh, asked. I know there's been a lot of controversy. Um, were there any of the uh, questions asked of you that you think that you need to expound upon uh, or to clarify um, that there still could be any confusion about? Um, I think all I'd say is, and, I, and this partly goes to one of the chairwoman's questions, also something you touched upon is, you know, does this rule, uh, you know, how can we say this rule is consistent with intermediate scrutiny in the Constitution? I think, you know, again, all the cases applying that, that test, and it's not the Justice Department, it's the courts, say the government has to show discrimination in the relevant area, which would be the area where the agency administers its contracts. And what the rule represents is a prudent approach to that standard. Basically, it's saying agencies get ready for the legal challenges, and if you want to sort of do the best you can to make sure your programs are upheld, which is what everyone, I think, would want to see with these programs, um, you should have your evidence. I would point out, though, the rule doesn't say exactly how much evidence an agency has to have, and and so I think, I feel like some of the com committee's maybe frustration with the rule, um, which is not a disagreement about the law, because the law is clear the government has to show discrimination. It's just does the rule sort of look like it makes it too hard on an agency? And I would just point out the rule doesn't require an agency to to have a specific level of, of discrimination. And then certainly, again, this is a prudent approach to complying with the Constitution, but if, if people feel like as a policy matter, um, you know, a riskier approach to – uh, the litigation challenges is uh, is appropriate, and that's certainly something that could come in also through the notice and comment. Thank you. So the gentleman yield? Uh, I'd be happy to yield to the gentleman. Uh, Ms. Popez, my frustration is that I asked you, where does the court rule? Tell me where that each agency has to show past discrimination. Not, not the federal government, but each agency. I just want for you to tell me which case? Well, the cases say the government, not the federal government, and in the cases where it's been a like a county, for example, or a county board doing the contracts, they say that county board. So it's the issue of whatever government entity is administering the contract. But that is not definitive. That is your interpretation. Well, I, no, I, but what I'm saying is 
that the cases require the government entity doing the program to show discrimination. And all the rule is saying is the best way to be able to meet that standard is to, is to have the showing. I mean, but it, the rule doesn't say how much or exactly what or, um, you know, it's consistent with the cases. It, it's not, it, there's not like some hard, fast I rule that says this has I yield to be. Back. Okay. Thank you. Reclaim my time and I yield back the balance of my time. And now I recognize Ms. Uh, recognize Ms. Clark. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Last week, I attended the uh, Wall Street Project uh, hosted by the Rainbow Push Coalition and the Reverend Jesse Jackson. It was a women's luncheon that uh, took place during our district work period. And I came away from that luncheon um, energized and knowing one thing, women-owned businesses are the fastest growing sector of our small businesses. But I sit here today and, and I feel like I'm in a time warp. Quite frankly, I just feel like I'm in a time warp and there's this huge disconnect between what is happening in the 21st century in uh, communities across this nation and what our government is, is really stuck on at this point. Um, it pains me, it totally frustrates me to hear and read that despite the, this progress, it's been seven years since the Equity and Contracting for Women Act of 2000 was enacted. Women-owned businesses are still underrepresented in many industry and regions across this country. Almost 50% of all the women-owned businesses provide goods and services to the federal government, yet this administration has continually failed to increase procurement opportunities and provide a fair share to a sector that has made an invaluable contribution to the federal marketplace. As you know, women-owned businesses recently received a meager 3.4% of small business contracting dollars from the federal government, which cost these businesses about $5 billion a year. This is disturbing when the federal government, the largest purchasing organization in the world, has seemingly not been able to provide a fair share of about $410 billion annual procurement spending to women-owned businesses. As a member of this committee, and as a member who just completed their first congressional session, I find it unacceptable that here we are yet again exploring and examining why the SBA has still not implemented the Women's Procurement Program. Now, I understand all of the uh, litigation and all of the challenges that we're facing in terms of interpretation of the law, but at what point is disparity morphed into discrimination? is really what we're trying to deal with here. Can we agree that it will take a concerted effort within your agency to break through this, this wall that has been built up through litigation? On the one hand, we have the acknowledgement that the participation of women-owned business is most desirable. On the other hand, we have this paralyzing fear of the court challenge that keeps your agency operating under a philosophy of the lowest expectations of what could possibly happen. The one thing I know is that at the end of the 110th session, the end of your administration's tenure, we will all be able to say that through the procurement mechanism for women-owned business, under the presidency of this administration, there was no support, no assistance, and virtually nothing was done. And I say, what a shame. Mr. Preston, in our last hearing, I asked you whether you believe that the SBA, and by extension, the federal government discriminated against women. You stated no. You did not believe this. Now your agency recently proposed a rule that would require agencies to find evidence of direct discrimination against women on small business in order to qualify for protected status. Is there a change in position here, or do you believe that there may be discrimination? Yeah, let me, you've got a number of points in your, in your speech. Let me make a couple of comments. First of all, I find it entirely unreasonable that you would say that about the administration. W contracts to women in the, during the administration have gone up two and a half times where they were when the president came into office. It's a 17% growth rate, and it's a significantly higher growth rate than occurred in the prior administration. But 5% has not been achieved. Five, I'm it, sorry. There's no child left behind. If you don't meet the mark, you shut down the school. Okay. Uh, significant. 
Uh, you also said it's a faster growing sector. We agree. Last year, the women-owned business sector in the federal government grew faster than any of the other set-aside programs. Uh, and so what I'm unwilling to do is to uh, l let there be any implication that we aren't working hard, making progress, and that the president uh, is for some reason not committed to this. The other thing is we rolled out a scorecard that w one of which, one of the measures uh, is the performance of women-owned business and, and ins expanded the transparency there. So I think this administration has done a lot here. We're presuming that a set-aside rule here is the only way through which we're going to expand contracting. And that is totally unrealistic, and it's not the right way to go, because I think that diminishes the strength of the businesses that are actually coming in here to do the contracting. So the other thing I'd like to highlight is your comment to me in the last hearing had to uh, uh, address discrimination with me personally. And that's why we got a little fire in the last hearing. Uh, your question did not have to do with discrimination more broadly. Thank you. Uh, if I may have a chance also to just uh, but you, you didn't answer my question. My question is, is, is there an acknowledgement now with the agency? And, and certainly, as the head of the agency, you would be able to determine this. This is something that, as the head of the agency, you would be able to see. This is something, as the head of the agency, you would set a tone for in terms of how all of your subordinates would focus on this project. It was not personal. And if you took it personally, I'm sorry. It certainly was not personal. It is to the office that you hold. Okay. Well, what I would tell you within the agency is 25 percent of our procurements this year went to women-owned small businesses. I think that shows a pretty big commitment within the agency. And I think if you look at the activities of people in the agency that have led to the expansion of this number dramatically over the past year, uh, you'll see commitment of people in the agency to expanding this goal. My time is up, but we're speaking about a very specific program here. And I think we need to focus on that, because that is where the failure exists. And I yield back, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Gomez. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And um, since all of this is being recorded, taken down, um, and I, I appreciate my friend Representative Gonzalez's comment about uh, Judge Curry uh, having been a judge, I, I just have to point out for posterity that any judge at the trial court level who says, I'm not going to follow the law, I'm going to make new law, is legislating from the bench and is violating his constitutional oath that he takes when he takes office. He's violating his oath. And I, I find that reprehensible. And Will I the gentleman ask, yield? Uh, sure. Oh, well, and if, ju the, if Judge Curry heard you say that, <clears throat> and you're a Texan, you'd probably be called out there uh, and y'all would have your six guns and you'd have a shootout because he's a very honorable man. I think what Judge Curry was saying, to be honest with, with you, it was telling the lawyers to think beyond where we may be today and to continue to advocate and fight for a more just society. I, it was I'm, his way of telling us. I'm of course saying. Judge Curry was going to follow his duties and his responsibilities. Well, I only said that time. as an example. Let me reclaim my time here. Uh, he was not following his oath. He was not following the law. He was creating law. And as a judge, the way that I would do that with, other, with lawyers was to say, I don't like this law. I think it's an unfair law. But I took an oath to follow the law. So I hope you will pursue this to the appellate court because I do not think it's fair and just, and that's where the change will be made. But my oath was to follow the law at this level, and that's what I'll have to do. But I would encourage the lawyers to think outside the box, just as you, and that's why I, I think um, uh, you were right when you felt like judge, the judge was being unfair. There and, you're, and you're speaking to the lawyer, as a matter I of understand. fact. I understand. I understand. And that's... And I would encourage that. But uh, just so everybody understands, too, just basic constitutional law, when we have programs that say we want you to specifically consider gender in awarding contracts, that violates the Constitution, except that it is allowed to violate the Constitutional if it is fixing past discrimination and fa past injustice. That's where we constitutionally allow discrimination based on race and gender is if there has been past discrimination. Otherwise, we can, and, and I hope and pray and look so forward to the day when we can achieve Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream of people being judged uh, by the content of their character, by their capability, 
and not by race, not by gender, but just by the content of what they can provide. But there are some, there have been uh, some injustices in the past, and I think just uh, Representative Clark's comment, you know, just when disparity uh, morphs into discrimination, that, that was a, a good characterization. That, that is the issue, but that still has to be addressed if it is going to pass constitutional muster. So I, th I think the problem is you've obviously felt from this committee is, you know, let's don't take too long finding those places where disparity has been uh, discrimination. Uh, let's fix those. Let's uh, address the, the discrimination so that we can move closer ever to that uh, day when we can live out uh, Martin Luther King's dream. Um, and, and just uh, a parenthetical, uh, the No Child Left Behind probably isn't an adequate um, comparison because I think that is an area where this administration has stepped far beyond its powers um, and started having the federal government tell local governments what they will, can Will do. the gentleman yield? Sure. I was saying That's that if, if in, in, with regard to the No Child Left Behind Act, if school districts didn't meet the goals, right. they were seen as failures. Right. By that was what I'm trying. I am yeah. not disparaging the, the program. I'm saying oh, I now am, we have a situation where we have a program. group that is saying that they have, well, well, we'll talk about that in the Edmund oh. Labor Committee. But <laughs> what I'm saying here is that now we're saying, well, we made a, 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 you know, a, a minimal movement, and so that should be touted as success when we actually had a goal of set at 5%, at which has never been met, and it's been seven years. The administration's almost over. I so I think we need to acknowledge that and not brush that aside and, and you know, pat ourselves on the back. I believe in movement, but then let's say that across the board, that everywhere we are in this administration, reclaim those standards my time here, are, are held. Thank you yeah. uh, for yielding. Yeah, and, and reclaim my time. Thank you. The, uh, my point is there, that is a, a, a program where the administration has vastly exceeded, in my opinion, their constitutional authority because they haven't really understood the Tenth Amendment. Um, but anyway, we appreciate your time and effort here, and we hope we'll continue to see great progress in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Quest, my last question now. Um, we have votes on the House floor. Uh, the regulation specifies four unique industries uh, as being underrepresented. Um, my question to you is, do you find it arbitrary? For instance, that your agency specifies that women are underrepresented in the field of kitchen cabinet making, but not in installing kitchen floors. Uh, no, I find that the information that came out of the RAND study was based on a methodology that was uh, supportable. So now I haven't looked at the specific kitchen floor category uh, to determine whether that's well. I or did. Not. That's my function here and should be your function too, to look at well, the industry and the, the RAND well, study. I've, I've looked at every number in that study uh, when and, and, and Mr. wax Preston, eloquent on them if you'd like. When I look at it and I saw, yes, for this one, kitchen cabinet making, but not in installing kitchen floors, you know my first reaction? This is silly. Ma'am, the, the, the category isn't kitchen cabinet making, it's a much broader cabinetry. Uh, category and gets to institutional furniture and all sorts of things. So, um, you know, I think it's important to look at the fullness of the category. Okay, my, la my last question to you is, uh, would you at least agree with me that this program, as currently crafted by uh, SBA, will do little, little to ensuring uh, the government will come closer to achieving its 5% uh, contracting goal for women-owned businesses. Yeah, I think the government's going to have to focus on many different things other than this program to reach those goals. Well, the focus of this uh, hearing today is this program, the Women's Procurement Program. And the fact is that after seven years, with all the things that you read in your testimony saying that we are training staff, that we're making these uh, changes, that there is a scorecard, I'm happy to know, that after all the many scorecards report that we issue from this side, that you decided and opted to issue your own scorecard. That's great. But yet, the 5% for women's procurement program has not been achieved. And with all these roadblocks under the proposed rule, I doubt it that it will be achieved. Well, I think it's important to note that there are no additional roadblocks being 
put in front of women uh, through this rule. This specifically deals f with an additional opportunity, not putting a roadblock in front of the opportunities that exist today. Uh, I think that all comes down to a philosophical disagreement with the program. Uh, with that, I excuse uh, the first panel, and uh, the committee will be uh, will adjourn until, until uh, we take the votes on the House floor. Yeah. Basically, we'll be back in 20 minutes. Must be dealing in the same circles. Um, so, I yeah. uh, catch you for a second here. What, what are your top priorities? And you must have been thinking about this for months trying to get the budget. What would you say are your three top priorities? Oh, um, I, uh, I, I'd have to. I'll email the Yeah, why don't I'll you? Email. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of focused on a few other things. Okay. <laughs> Oh, I hate to say this. I hate to stop saying things. I am. Sorry. 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 Sorry.